Uh, thank you very much, uh, Katrina. She's one of my heroes. <coughs> she was there in the very beginning uh, at a time when uh, no one believed, and she kept working on it. There's another person in the audience we need to recognize, which is uh, Larry Goldstein, who's in the, in the back corner. Uh, <coughs> Larry was the co-chair of my scientific advisory group when I wrote the initiative. And he was uh, really a critical element in the, in the campaign. He was everywhere for, between press and scientific meetings and working with us on the, on the polling and the, and the strategy. It takes a lot of people. Uh, really, uh, we're indebted to the seven 0.2 million Californians that voted for us in uh, one of the worst years for the California economy in 50 years. In 2004, in April, they had to sell 15 billion of deficit funding bonds to pay the highway patrol and the harbor police and everybody else. And yet the voters voted for the initiative in November of that year. Uh, it takes the voters to approve 6 billion to get $3 billion because you've got to approve all of the interest that's going to be spent over the following 30 years. So the voters have to be given credit for vision. Uh, and it's for uh, patients like Sandra that make it all worthwhile. Today, we're going <coughs> to talk about um, one of the great innovations that has come through uh, CIRM, and I'd like the panelists if they could all uh, first come to the table. <clears throat> this innovation called Alpha Clinics and the impact on human trials with dealing with challenges and the solutions that are unique through the Alpha Clinic uh, Network Program. Uh, started really with Dr. Alan Trounson's idea in uh, 2011 when June, May and June of 2011, we had a board resolution supporting it when I was still chairman. But the truth be known, it really took uh, uh, <clears throat> the Maria Milan to be a champion for this program and to drive uh, incessantly uh, <clears throat> the program's advantages home to uh, the senior staff and the board for it to become <clears throat> um, a real integral leading part of the CIRM uh, contributions to human trials in California and hopefully as a model that can <clears throat> contribute to the rest of the nation and learn from other models in, in the nation. So uh, Maria, I'd like to uh, uh, start with you and maybe you could give us an overview of the Alpha Clinics from a, a statewide perspective. <clears throat> How many human trials, uh, if you can just give us a quantified image, uh, how many patients has it served? How many human trials has it served? Uh, <clears throat> The, um, so that how many diseases has it served so we can see a spectrum of the impact at this point. Thank you, Bob. And um, I wanted just to acknowledge the vision that you, from the very beginning, had in terms of um, the fact that we would need to build something like this to be the vehicle to, um, you know, once the science is ready to go into the clinics. So um, the Alpha Clinics Network was set up a, as a unique network that would bring in specialists and special resources from already top institutions that had a, had a um, commitment to bringing uh, stem cell regenerative medicine to patients. And uh, UC San Diego was one of the um, uh, first clinics to be awarded, along with City of Hope and the UCLA Irvine, and then we were fortunate to expand it to UC Davis and UCSF Benioff. And this, when we first started this, ex what we call ex an experiment, 
um, of a specialized clinic to address um, an emerging field, which at that point there weren't that many clinical trials actually. Um, and uh, so to just give you an idea of if you build it, they will come within the first year, I think, CAT, we may probably had a, a, a almost 10 clinical trials already um, supported by the clinic. And now over uh, 70 trials have been supported by this Alpha Clinics network. The number itself is impressive, but there's this multiplier effect of um, not only um, the, the aggregate of the clinical trials and the diversity of platforms that are being um, supported, but all of the assets that were then built within the clinic, accelerating resources such as a shared IRB called the Smart IRB, which is a web-based IRB. And what that means for those who are, have been involved in clinical trials, want to be involved in clinical trials, and those who are running clinical trials is the difference between being able to start up one site with being able to start up five or six sites because you, you can rely on the expertise of, of um, an IRB from one institution to inform the rest of the organizations that are involved in it, and they trust this, and they can then initiate. Another, um, so it served 30 different disease indications, Bob, to your question, that it's um, just like CIRM is disease um, and technology agnostic, as long as it serves stem cell regenerative medicine, so is the Alpha Clinics Network. So it's there's a diversity and in disease indications and platforms or cell and gene therapy um, combination uh, approaches, very unique approaches, even in utero transplantation. So it's, it's, an, it's a really quite an amazing, um, an amazing accomplishment. And the clinic have enrolled over 400 patients just in the clinic. Um, CIRM itself in, in its 51 clinical trials, 1,000 programs has enrolled over 1,200 Californians um, who are our partners, our patients are our partners in these um, transformative treatments. So it's a really amazing vehicle that, as I, that, um, that really has multiplied the effect of each given patient, each given trial. And it's because of the program directors who are sitting here at the table um, and their leadership that's made this possible. Great. And so you've talked about the structural benefits and the best practices uh, and uh, <clears throat> that, are, that are shared. Uh, could you take a moment and explain through the Alpha Clinic the personnel that you fund in the Alpha Clinics to make this coordination and deal with these complex trials possible? It's, I, it's so incredible because there's so many stories because I think Kat had, had stated it right, it's about the people. And so when you think about how many initiatives are sometimes launched and said, we're gonna make things more efficient. We're gonna put this in place because it's gonna make things go faster. And they, you pour a lot of money into it, you, you know, build buildings and this and that and nothing happens, right? With this initiative, what's happened is the, are the people of the assets, right? So the, there are dedicated patient counselors, patient care coordinators, the, the uh, program directors are the kind of the link with all the resources within the medical center. So I'll give you a couple of examples. We've launched, uh, the Alpha Clinics has launched this attempt to standardize contracts. So when, um, when um, industry uh, sponsors um, want to come to one site, then potentially you're able to open up simultaneous sites and not be held up at each institution. And so it's been piloted, and um, I think one is in, the, is in progress right now, and within 30 days there was an agreement by two different, imagine two different universities, two different hospitals, two different administrative staffs, two different sets of lawyers, two terms. So, and, and when I heard about kind of what made this happen, a lot of, uh, a lot of people were involved, our lawyers, uh, the institution's lawyers, the, the leadership, but it was the patient care coordinators, the coordinators, the people on the front line were the ones that made sure that the, the, right, the right meetings were called, they were getting together, so it's really in the fine detail. And it's because there's that dedicated group that understands the urgency that, that who meet the patients who are seeking you know, um, these um, treatments and they can't wait. That's what motivates them, that's what's making it successful. 
Great, thank you. And talking about dedicated people, <clears throat> um, the CIRM staff is only about 60 people running this entire program with over 1,000 grants uh, in the state. So 94 cents on every dollar goes out to grants. And there's, I see at least three members of the CIRM st uh, staff in, in the audience. If you could raise your hands. Uh, the, Please, or, during the day, thank them. We have a because, lawyer out there, too. Uh, okay, in the back. Uh, <laughs> because uh, it looks like we have five, five members. But they're phenomenally committed individuals who have moved mountains to make this happen. In, in implementing this uh, uh, program, Dr. Uh, Siachi, if you could explain in San Diego, um, when you're faced with um, uh, the spinal cord trial for chronic injury that you're involved with, uh, what are the <clears throat> resources, physical resources first, that you're able to draw upon that you pull together in, uh, in doing this complex trial that make alpha, an alpha clinic so, so powerful? Uh, Dr. Siachi is not here, but Dr. Chachi is here. Okay, <laughs> Chachi, sorry. <laughs> so uh, I, think, I think, you know, I'm really pleased to hear everyone reinforcing the idea that it's about patients and then about the people uh, who are, who are uh, contributing to the effort. And so what's special about California, what's special about CIRM, what's special about Alpha Clinic is that we open ourselves to serving others and recognizing that without monumental efforts outside the ordinary, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of the things that we do. So infrastructure-wise, we rely from admin support, uh, clinical coordinators, program directors, administrators that work for CIRM. You know, uh, it's just so many people. Uh, you know, the, probably the smallest group is the people that actually end up in the operating room when you think about the number of people that contribute and, and the resources. Uh, I'm still, after several years, discovering just how vast uh, the help that's available to us is, and, and we owe all of our success to everyone who's contributed. Yeah, and <clears throat> here in San Diego, you've been very fortunate because the Jacobs Hospital that was recently brought online actually has committed uh, beds for uh, stem cell therapies. You have the Sanford Clinic. Uh, you have <clears throat> The core at the Sanford uh, uh, Burnham, you have the large animal facility at Elliott Field. So uh, you've got a tremendous amount of physical resources. Uh, if it's just going to that extra point of being able to have the personnel through the Alpha Clinic that can pull them all together and, and really accomplish uh, some very tough um, uh, trials that are that are there, but uh, were not reachable before. And I think uh, <clears throat> I'll hopefully this uh, pronunciation is is correct. But uh, <clears throat> Dr. Abidi, uh, if you could comment on uh, the complex trials that you've undertaken and been involved in, uh, renal transplant with bone marrow uh, um, transplant. That where the feasibility was just too daunting without the Alpha Clinic human resources that were funded. So one of the, uh, the challenges of any uh, type of cellular therapy, gene therapy, is the complexity. Um, when you give, you know, I, I'm, I'm running many clinical trials with drugs, and, you know, whether that's coming from, uh, from our groups or coming from pharma, uh, it's basically administration of drugs, maybe some uh, pharmacokinetics, uh, you know, blood drawn or something like that, and then looking at the efficacy, and that's about it. So clinical trials are usually very straightforward when you're talking about the single drugs. When you're talking about the cell therapy, oh my God, it's a completely different story. Many times we have to uh, get multiple different groups together. And, and that becomes uh, a major hurdle, hurdle here that there's just, you know, investigators are not interested. Uh, they say, we have problem within our own department running trials. I don't want to deal with five different departments or divisions to, to do that. Uh, and again, examples of that, for example, was our, uh, our gene therapy trials uh, for, uh, for HIV. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we were trying to take the stem cells 
from patients who need an autologous transplant for HIV patients. Uh, these patients routinely get autologous transplant for treating their lymphoma. So if they have a lymphoma, they require autologous transplant. Uh, the idea was that at the same time, can we make them resistant to HIV? Uh, so kind of like trying to kill two birds one, one stone here. Uh, it just sounds you know, great, great idea, but just practicality is something that kills many, many clinical trials in its process. They're just, it stays in the basic science and never get to the clinic because just not practical. There's too many, you know, too many, you know, too much trouble. They, you know, they don't want to get to that. So just imagine just doing something like that. We have to deal with the division of pathology because that's where apheresis was, collecting the cells. We have to deal with hematology oncology group, that's where the lymphoma patients are, transplant group, that's where to transplant them, uh, <coughs> progenitor lab and stem cell labs, uh, GMP facility to deal with that, HIV doctors that are separate, again, separate groups there, all the correlative you know, work that we're doing with immunology uh, uh, and immune groups there. So all of these things have to come together, and I think that's a challenge of, uh, of doing cellular therapy trials there plus all the regulatory part of it that's way, way, way more than the regular drug regulatory uh, uh, you know, aspect there. Uh, and the Alpha Clinic really gave us the opportunity, the serum gave us the opportunity to do that, to put all of these people together to be able to run and start uh, these trials there. Another example, our transplant, our renal transplant page, uh, you know, uh, people, they were approached by uh, companies of, of doing an allogenic bone marrow transplant at the same time of doing a renal transplant there. Uh, and the idea was to make the, the patients uh, toler you know, tolerant to the, the kidney transplant with minimal toxicity. They say, no way, we can't even handle our own you know, workload here with the renal transplant. You want to get an, you know, a bone marrow transplant on top of that. So they rejected that. When we Alpha Clinic came to the board, we says, you know, that's our job. That's our job to coordinate and make this happen there. And we went back there, we negotiated with the company, we get uh, everything you know, in place. Our transplant groups uh, are helping with the renal transplant groups now to make this happen there. So the complexities of, of cellular therapy is, is you know, there's no question it's complex, but having a, a, a coherent group there to just, that's dedicated, that's all they're doing. They're doing cellular therapy, uh, regulatory part, uh, you know, practical part. We have a clinic there that uh, that's all we're doing. We, you know, we are expert on collecting the cells, in manipulating the cells, in administering the cells, and having all the SOPs and uh, uh, kind of like FDA proof, uh, you know, documents there. If something goes wrong, we have all the documents there. Something that nobody else want to touch, other groups, other uh, clinical groups, they don't want to touch there. But we can, you know, we just say this is a one, uh, want to stop shopping there. You can have everything done in one place there successfully, and you don't have to worry about that, so let's just do it. And just you know, that, that's why we have so many trials now. Within a very short period of time since we got the Alpha Clinic uh, in our center, I think we are uh, running about 20-something trials. There is another 20-something other trials pending to open up very soon there. It's very, very exciting time. And so I think, uh, Doctor, your point with me was that <coughs> Having that full-time centralized staff was critical because they, they could see the whole picture as versus fragments of the picture because each person with a fragment couldn't put together the whole. So having that Alpha Clinic full-time staff was pivotal. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Pettis, uh, you've been working with Viasite on their type 1 trial and I think you had some uh, similar views about how important that, uh, that funding of the personnel was for complex trial coordination. Could you talk about, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, talk about that and um, your particular experience with uh, the Alpha Clinics? Yeah, sure. So this study, a little bit of, of background, is that basically we're taking stem cells and um, encapsulating them in these devices um, that, are f that are capable of becoming insulin-producing beta cells, and then implanting them under the skin in people with type 1 diabetes. So people with type 1 diabetes are completely devoid of, of insulin production, so the hope is to essentially cure type 1 diabetes with these implantations. 
And we started the, the trial kind of naively thinking we'd implant these and that would be that. Um, of course, that didn't happen. Um, but uh, we quickly learned that when we would take these devices out, we would learn a lot from that first patient. And literally after the first patient, we went back to the IRB and completely changed the protocol, which means we'd have to redo the budget. And after the second you know, patient, we did the whole thing again. You know, and so at universities, they typically don't provide coordinators or nurses or anything like that. So it's on the investigator to provide all these services. And especially as a younger investigator, having to provide these services and do all this regulatory work myself um, is just impossible. So I think the vision of the Alpha Clinic in part was to speed up these trials, but it also is to make them possible. Because literally without the, the Alpha Clinic, it just wouldn't have, have happened. And that's not hyperbole at all. It's just that the, the trial would have shut down from a, a logistical you know, side of things. And I know that the, you know, you know, maybe coordinators and IRB and budgets isn't the sexy part of science. That's definitely true. So it requires a lot of vision to invest in this infrastructure, because, but it's so important. Um, and without the, uh, the Alpha Clinic, I mean, literally, this stem cell trial would have, would have stopped probably a long time ago. Right. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's important for everyone to have a context here. Uh, Dr. Pettis is hitting at a fundamental point. The hospitals don't view these trials as revenue positive. This is not their business. So they're accommodating doing these, these trials, but they're not going to provide these services because it's not in their core and they're, they're, in their view, they're contributing time that they need for revenue. So it's critical that there's a state agency <coughs> Uh, like CIRM that is providing the funding for these, these pivotal personnel who can bring these resources together that are already there. So you have huge assets invested, but you need the, that expertise to coordinate it and make it, uh, it actually feasible. The other point, Dr. P uh, Pettis, that I think is a challenge that's still out there that you've talked to me about is that as you're going forward and you have something <coughs> that's working and there's something that comes into the field that you're now aware of that, that is per perhaps an improvement or something that you could bring in to enhance what is happening, do you want to talk about the practical issues for uh, whether it's a nonprofit sponsor or a company of being faced with something that is proceeding and is efficacious, but you become aware that there's an improvement and the constraints on actually being able to, to access that improvement. Yeah, I, I think that is potentially a, you know, a fundamental problem that it, it requires so much effort and money to get these, these trials to in, in a clinical setting. But once you get there, you lose a little bit, in my opinion, your ability to innovate. Because if something you know, comes along that you want to go kind of and, and change fundamentally some way the project, it generally requires going back to the FDA and restarting the whole process, which can become overwhelming. So I think there, there could be ways to kind of streamline that process to allow innovation to happen with kind of ongoing clinical trials to allow these studies to continue to follow you know, the science and the best practices for, the, for those patients. So I don't have the answer, but I think that, that is you know, an issue. Yeah, so it's a challenge that's sitting out there, and hopefully if we can get CIRM a whole nother block of funds, it's another challenge that given their tremendous track record, they'll uh, be able to take on. So uh, Dr. Uh, Walters uh, at UCSF, uh, as part of the UCSF uh, system, could you talk about how the Alpha Clinic has worked in terms of this IRB delegation that Maria talked about and uh, how has that worked and how, how well have has it worked trying to get IRB amendments uh, as things have had to change in, in progressing through a trial? Thanks, Bob. And um, UCSF is one of the new kids on the block. We uh, got our first funding in, in December 2017, so we're just over, a little over a year into this. And so, um, so I've leaned heavily on the established centers in San Diego and East LA, Irvine, City of Hope, and this was one of the things that we learned was that um, that we could bypass some of the the necessary delays created by uh, separate IRB reviews and even having to go 
to the full board by relying on this smart IRB mechanism. And so it was one of the first things we instituted. In addition, the, the, the reason why we were invited into this, um, in, into this club, if you will, was because of our um, strong interest in, uh, in pediatric disorders, particularly the hered hereditary ones. So, um, and, and one disease I'm, I'm particularly focused on is sickle cell disease, and, and we have some very cutting edge uh, genomic correction gene therapy trials that, um, that are working. And uh, this is important because um, there's a gap in access to cures for sickle cell disease. Even though we know you can cure it with a bone marrow transplant from a healthy brother or sister, fewer than 1% actually pursue it because most don't have a donor and it's a risky treatment. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that um, we brought on board were some, some novel genomic editing trials that um, both Davis and UCLA were interested in, in, in participating in. So immediately we broaden access to the participation in those trials. And that's really important for sickle cell disease because it isn't, well, it's never simple to move to the one center that exists in the United States to get the treatment. But if we could create two new centers close to where the patients live, that immediately removes an important barrier to par participation. So the IRB reliance, the sharing of the clinical trial agreement, because this was an industry-sponsored trial, um, really accelerated getting, getting those trials started at more than, more than one site. So I'd like to think that, that uh, adding us uh, contributed to the model of, of the whole network, which is that now more patients have access participating in a trial that might one day turn into a standard treatment that would be a curative treatment. And, and my dream, even though we're, I'm not going to do this in my lifetime probably, but my dream would be, you know, we, we diagnose this disease or diseases like it, like primary immune deficiencies, by newborn screening. Why not just do the correction as soon as you've made the diagnosis before that, that child has its first complication that lands them in the hospital, either an infection or a painful event. I mean, wouldn't that be spectacular? So that's, that's what we're here for, is to accelerate that kind of thinking and to do, this, to do the studies, both basic translational and then the clinical trials, to have the expertise and the infrastructure to, to carry those out. So I, I'm really excited to join this club, and um, I'm happy to make a few little contributions, but mostly I've been learning for the past year. Uh, thank you. And <clears throat> another point that you really uh, brought to my attention was that in trying to get uh, from an initiation uh, to a patient in 90 days, one of the big stumbling uh, blocks has been <clears throat> trying to get the hospitals to deal with the budget. Because with novel trials, the hospital is just not uh, ready to figure out a what's the cost, and who's going to reimburse it. Uh, the, can you talk about what it t kind of time it takes to get those budgets, and, and what are the concerns of the people that make this so difficult to get the hospital personnel to get this done quickly? Oh, oh of course, and I wish I had more time, so I'm going to try to keep this brief, because this is <laughs> one of my favorite topics. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the nightmares you hear all the time, I, at UCSF and elsewhere is that by the time you finally get the darn study approved and, and, and started, it's ready to close. So you have two weeks to enroll one patient and then it's over because everyone else has already been enrolling patients and they've completed the study. So um, yeah, typically it, it could take up to six months to go through the, that whole process. And so, and one of the reasons for that is because public institutions that have a lot of public funding uh, all, uh, the people that ensure compliance feel like there's a big bullseye on us because if we're not compliant, then um, everything will, will come grinding to a halt until that problem's fixed. So there's a lot of careful oversight to make sure that we are completely compliant, that if a, if a study-related test is being performed, it's charged to the study sponsor and not to that person's insurance. Because you can imagine how that could get fouled up in, in, and, and why that would be a compliance nightmare. So it takes a lot of time to ensure that each event that happens while you're in the hospital or in the clinic is appropriately designated to the right source. And so um, I, I think a large, a large part of this has to do with 
the painstaking work that's required to ensure that's done properly. So, um, but there are ways to speed this up, and a, a lot of it has to do with having a, com a, a competent, experienced staff that can do this quickly, and that the organization has confidence in that can do it quickly. And so once, once you've accomplished those two things, then I think it's possible to have the time to, to approval. So that's, that's how we're building the infrastructure in San Francisco, UCSF, is that we, we want to take some of that away from the generic staffs that do the, the coverage analysis, for example, and let us do it because we know what this looks like for this kind of trial, and we can do it actually more competently than the people that are doing it currently. So that's, that's one example of, of how we're approaching this. Sorry right. for the long answer. No, I think it's an important for people to understand because it stands between the doctors, the scientists, and getting to the patient. Uh, and <coughs> uh, I think you've emphasized institutional reputation uh, where people from these eminent universities who are at, associated with the directly and leading the participation for these alpha clinics, the staff is very defensive uh, about making a mistake. And so ha perhaps we should look at some statutory way to give them a safe harbor because it is patients who should be the number one concern. Uh, they're trying to protect patients in their own way because they know if they compromise the reputation of the hospital, they could hurt patients in the long run. So we need a way to protect them, but certainly having expert staff funded through the Alpha Clinic helps uh, build that confidence. And Dr. Uh, Pettis, I think you had the same kind of problem with budgeting because uh, <clears throat> having to, uh, to deal with an implant was so something the hospital uh, staff wasn't used to figuring out how to price, is that right? Yeah, I just think you know, we were doing this procedure that had never really been done before, so how much does that cost? You know, and um, it takes a while to kind of figure that out and kind of come up with a new case rate for what that is. And, and yes, this interface between, you know, the hospital and, and the study sponsor, we had patients being billed for, you know, procedures and things like that to their insurance. So, so that's a problem. And I think, so there's a lot of things that slow that down, but creating that budget, it starts with how much it costs and then negotiating it with whoever ultimately is paying for it. Um, and then on the other side of the people that are reviewing the budgets, reviewing the IRB, yeah, I think they're incentivized to not make mistakes and they're less incentivized to, to move quickly or to, you know, expeditiously. So it's just about people's ultimate kind of goals, I suppose. Great. And uh, uh, Dr. Jameson, uh, you know, you've been a hero in driving uh, from the early days of CIRM, a number of these therapies, uh, all the way from discovery, from seed grants with people in your labs, through uh, translation, development, preclinical, phase one, phase two. Fedratinib is in phase three. Uh, there's others uh, that are phase two uh, trials. <coughs> um, an extraordinary performance, but uh, many times at a cost to yourself, I understand that at one point, uh, you were putting so much time in for clinical trials that uh, the hospital cut your sta your salary by 50% because your work uh, <clears throat> uh, RVUs were not meeting the total billing hours they expected in clinical work. So the, uh, can you talk about the importance of CIRM in addressing this issue? Yeah, it was 15%, but anyway. Okay. <laughs> you know what, once it had a five in it, it seemed like a big number to me. Yeah, I think this gets to a very important uh, picture, and that is how we reimburse physicians for providing quality care. And we have a number of patients, we're all gonna be patients, we're all going to be consumers of healthcare, and I think that we should all be patient advocates, therefore. And to be a patient advocate means that we have to advocate for quality care, not quantity care. So at the moment, our care is delivered by work RVUs, relative value unit. That's how we get paid. And this will change in the US. Uh, we're switching to a different model where it will be about quality care, and it, it can't come soon enough. Uh, because it's very difficult to do clinical trials and bill a work RVU rate that is commensurate with the amount of time it takes to see someone on clinical trials. And fortunately, I was well-funded by CIRM. Thank you, Bob. 
Uh, so the the fifteen percent didn't hurt too much, uh, but the I, th I think the whole point is we need to invest in our investigators. Uh, we need to invest in everyone here so they can publish very nicely with Dr. Chari, and uh, you know uh, we need to compensate Dr. Chachi's time, Dr. Pettis's time, uh, Dr. Betty and Dr. Walter's time because. And not to mention Maria, who's also a surgeon. She'll never, she doesn't usually talk about that. I have zero RVU. And now. you have zero <laughs> RVUs anymore. So this no, is don't cut her salary. <laughs> <laughs> but this, it, this is such a, a seemingly crass issue, but it's so important that physicians get invigorated about doing clinical trials. Uh, and scientists are able to work alongside physicians to be able to develop uh, the next generation of not just therapeutics, but diagnostics, so we can predict and prevent uh, the outcomes of the sometimes inherited diseases, as Mark is planning to do, sometimes acquired diseases, as Merdad is doing, and also uh, Jeremy's doing, and sometimes diseases induced by trauma, as Joe is doing uh, for people with spinal cord injury. Uh, so this is something that I think we all need to look at. I think if we restructure the Alpha Clinics, I would be extremely happy to have funding dedicated to clinical investigators. It's something that's very hard for department chairs like Brian Clary, uh, who is uh, really very resourceful at getting funding for his uh, staff and faculty. Uh, but nonetheless, for all of us who run divisions or departments, it's a tough thing to deal with. So if that could be a, a part of the Alpha Clinics, and we've fortunately had some funding for that, but if we could make that just an established part, I think that would help. The other thing I think would help a lot is if and this is very uh, self-serving uh, to, or serving to my faculty, is to really allow these partnerships with physicians and scientists so we can accelerate discovery a little bit more quickly. So if a scientist is working alongside an alpha clinic, they get compensation as well. So I just wanted to point out the scientists in the audience here uh, who form a seminal part of our pipeline. So we've got uh, not to mention the, just the people from New York who spoke already. Thank you. Uh, no, but uh, Leslie Cruz, uh, Rob Signer, Dan Kaufman, uh, we, these are the people in our division, Mary Donahoe is sitting back there. Uh, so we've got, uh, I know I'm missing scientists that are in the Division of Regenerative Medicine, but um, I think to get all of this together, we have to get it into the clinic. Betty Cabrera is the one who's done all this coverage analysis, and uh, Betty, if you want to put up your hand, she's the reason we've been able to tra traverse this contracting landscape. Kimmy DeNoble uh, was responsible for emergency INDs and uh, really making sure that we get everything to the clinic. And then we've had stellar clinical research coordinators like Riley Kidwell, who graduated to medical school. So I guess the point, Bob, is this is a team effort. Mm -hmm. This is a talented, tenacious team. That's what Sandra was alluding to. And we'll never give up on you. Yeah. Right. But I think it, it should be recognized uh, as I understand it, the phenomenon is widespread. There's a lot of physicians that just don't want to get into clinical trials because they've got to carry their clinical base. Uh, in addition, uh, <clears throat> when they put time into a clinical trial, they've got to figure out who's going to cover their patients, uh, which is a compounding uh, influence. And I think we're going to have to systematically look at how institutionally to support those individuals and have the in institutions encourage physician participation in, in the clinical trials because they are fundamental uh, core leadership and they are the empathetic uh, confidence relationship with the patient. So Sheila, uh, Chari, you as editor-in-chief of uh, Cell, Stem Cell, <coughs> have um, broken out to new territory because you, uh, as a as a publication that is focused on basic and developmental science, have recently in the last few years uh, done <coughs> uh, articles on, uh, on a, several uh, clinical trials. And in looking at the Alpha Clinic uh, experience, which is also an article that you were editor on, <coughs> um, can you give us some insights of, of uh, your experience at looking at this uh, experiment of uh, the people of California. Yes, thanks for giving me the opportunity. So um, as Bob mentioned, 
you know, at Cell Stem Cell, we are passionate about communicating high quality science that is into basic insights of stem cell biology, but also more increasingly as discoveries are brought into the clinic, we are starting to publish early clinical trial results. And we were fortunate to publish two CERM funded trials last year. Um, and so uh, we feel like we're very well positioned to cover this area because it, our readership really uh, spans the, um, the breadth of partnerships that are required to, um, to bring these experimental therapies into the clinic. And that's really uh, a point that the Alpha Clinic collaborations really um, drive home very well. And so um, our papers really uh, can take a different sp um, spin on clinical work and show the really important basic research, I, uh, IND enabling work that CIRM also funds, um, all the way up to the actual results of the trial. So I think uh, Dr. Chiachi's trial is a really good example of a paper that, unlike most clinical papers, really took um, the basic insights, looking in um, animal models and characterizing the cells, their mechanism of action, all the way to um, results um, showing supporting uh, safety and feasibility. Um, when transplanted into patients. And so um, I really think that reflects this uh, kind of the span of what the Alpha Clinics have done. Thank you. I thought we would leave some, a few minutes here for uh, questions that you have a phenomenal uh, group of, of scientists and, <coughs> and leaders in human trials uh, that are sitting before you. And, Individuals with some real courage, Dr. Chachi took on chronic uh, spinal cord injury. Everyone is focused on the extreme difficulty with acute spinal cord injury. He took on chronic uh, uh, spinal cord injury. So um, in terms of complex trials, it's a wonderful group of scientists and physicians. Uh, do we have any questions that in the audience? Yes. You, there's a microphone here for you. All of uh, you who are involved in, in the clinical trials themselves, um, do you feel that the alpha stem cell clinics in this uh, process that you've gone through has altered the institutions? Have we been able to teach the institutions? Because if, if it's purely dependent on alpha stem cell clinics and if, God forbid, one day they go away, you know, have, we, have we shifted the, um, the awareness and the expertise within the institutions that we can carry on. Uh, I'd like I, I to can, tackle that just no, really no, no. quickly, Murdad, and then I'll... So it, at least in our institution, we, you know, we've had leadership from Larry Goldstein and the San Francisco Clinical Center to really be able to apply resources to the institution and see the Alpha Stem Cell Clinics as a clinical trial office that really uh, offsets costs, actually reduces costs because of the economy of scale that we can apply to cellular therapies and complex uh, clinical trials. So I think that's been very important. We've had really a great um, support from our leadership, and I think um, Scott Lipman has really made a big difference by having an MOU so we can do things with the Alpha Clinic, so partner with the Cancer Center, for example, and we have other groups that we work with. So I think um, the Alpha Clinics have really helped to accelerate trials when we found these partnerships, and I think that's just a way to go forward when you have very complex clinical trials. and need all the investigators to be in one place, as Merdad was alluding to. I, I, I wanted to take the opportunity, though, to speak on behalf of the university, the health system, the hospital, the departmental leadership. I mean, we hear a little bit of almost a negative uh, view that it's only driven by our productivity and, and, and billing and such, but uh, most of us were brought here by the university for the purpose of doing this kind of academic work, and we are supported. Uh, by our leadership for that. And, and the hospital and the health system have provided a lot of the tools that we need to do sophisticated interventions that we do. So it really is a collaboration that involves everyone. And I also think the Alpha Clinic support got a little bit short changed in terms of their scientific contribution, not just infrastructure, because writing the papers that we've written and that we've been lucky enough to, to publish in meaningful journals that ha have real science, it's all been contributions in the editing process and the writing process and the innovative idea process. So thanks to everybody that's in here. You know, Gay, I mean, um, I mean, look at the work you're doing that's going to hit the clinic eventually. And um, 
in, in all these novel therapies that will one day be licensed, there's a wave of cell therapy that's going to be interdigitated into the medical practice. And frankly, um, the knowledge that, that, that we're gaining by participating in these trials now will, will extend to competencies and, um, and, and the safe delivery of the therapies when, when they're ready for um, you know, real time. So I, I think it's an amazing investment just in the health of, of, of uh, our citizenry, basically. I, now, ha have we established something that will be self-sustaining at UCSF? No. But we, I mean, we're we're so early, so early into this. But have we expanded the the um, the spectrum of uh, disorders that might be treated by cell therapy? I think so. I think I think because of the way the uh, industry sponsors are reaching out to the Alpha Stem Cell Network and then to us individually, it's it's really we made good connections with individual investigators who wouldn't otherwise have access to opening those trials. So it's that sort of thing that I think well it will begin to bear fruit. But it, it takes a, it takes a bit of time. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, add that <clears throat> for sustained uh, commitment with real depth, um, the San Diego community is blessed by having Denny Sanford, Malin Burnham, Irwin Jacobs, Stephen Lisa Altman, to name a few individuals. That <clears throat> Larry Goldstein and uh, Katrina and others have spent a tremendous amount of time educating the community about the phenomenal impact they can make on human suffering uh, and bringing them in as sustained support is critical. You know, Alpha Clinics is part of it, CERM is part of it, but the community support with these phenomenal resources is a critical component. That infrastructure and the ongoing supplemental support, uh, whether it's from the Sanford Clinic or other sources, is is vital so every physician and scientist uh, their outreach to that community to support that alpha clinic is critical to its current performance and uh, sustainability uh, do we have another question any other questions <clears throat> well i would just um uh, end uh with um with one point here which is that um, we have a phenomenal uh, experiment that has got a great track record in a short, uh, a short period of time. But uh, from New York, uh, from every place else uh, in the country, in the world, California is, is collaborative and open to learning. And hopefully we can trade these best practices and ideas uh, with other parts of the country and the world and enhance it. But at the end, we are a dependent in serving these patients and creating a whole new era of medicine, reducing human suffering on the, the scientists and physicians that are in front of you, on the scientists and physicians in this audience, uh, and on the personnel who, who give up some very high-paying positions to serve on CERM staff to serve in, uh, in government at, at many levels and to serve in academic, on academic staffs when they have many other opportunities. It's the commitment and uh, personal sacrifice and tenacity, as Katrina loved to say, of the individuals that change possibility into reality and uh, wonderful stories like Sandra's. Thank you.